Okay. Oops. So I want to talk about two-point source interference here. So let's just write our title down. Two-point source interference. All right. So generally how we think about this is this is a scenario where you have a tank of water, say, and you have two objects vibrating inside the water, and they are spreading waves outward from themselves. And when those two waves come into contact, in some cases, crests will meet crests and troughs will meet troughs, and you'll get areas of constructive interference. Okay. In other scenarios, right, you'll have crests meeting troughs, and that is going to give you destructive interference. Okay, we haven't really covered interference in you know in two dimensional waves. We covered it in one dimension, um, but this is kind of a combination between the scenario where you would have two waves coming towards each other and constructively interfering, right? As they pass, they double in amplitude, and and the other scenario where you have destructive interference. So it's combining this scenario uh, with the other scenario that we had, which were standing waves. Okay, So if you remember, standing waves happen when we have a string or a spring, and it's oscillating, and it sets up these patterns within it, right? And we talked about all the different kinds of patterns that might get set up in here. And there's certain places where there is no wave, and we called those nodes. That's due to destructive interference happening at those points. And at other points, there's anti-nodes. Okay? So anti-nodes are where we have constructive interference. And we sort of walked through all the different scenarios and looked at the fact that, you know, as you increase frequency, you increase the number of nodes and anti-nodes. Okay? These are nodes. And these are anti-nodes. So we're going to combine sort of these two concepts when we talk about two-point source interference. You have, to, you have to use your imagination a little bit when you're working through this. Um, but probably what you'll be able to kind of think about is this, this would represent like a top-down view, or, or, or this would represent a top-down view of two, of two points within you know, a tank of water being tapped. Okay? The velocity of the waves is set by the medium, by the depth of the water. And so as you say increase the frequency of the taps, you're going to shorten the wavelength and it's going to change the pattern. Before we get to that, let's imagine what this is meant to represent. So what this is, what this is attempting to show here would be if you want crest, trough, crest, trough, crest. So I'm going to draw that. And you're going to have to imagine that you're looking at the top of a crest and the bottom of a trough. But if we were to like kind of draw in here what we're talking about, you kind of have this going on, okay? So that's sort of what this is meant to represent, kind of in, in, in top-down view. So if we look, there are certain points along here where crests are meeting crests, right? Crest to crest. Then right next to it, there's points where a crest is meeting a trough. If you look at this picture, Okay, this is more of an actual picture. I think it's computer generated, but it gives you kind of a better idea of what this looks like in actual practice. And you can see that there are areas where there's no wave activity and areas where there is wave activity. Okay, these big areas are called the anti nodes. So we're going to label them. Okay, so we've got an anti node here. And actually, this has a special name and it's called the central maximum. So we're going to actually give it its own letter, and that's going to be the letter C. Okay. In the center, equidistance from each of the points, wherever you look, you get constructive interference happening. You can see that happening here. Crest on crest, trough on trough, crest on crest, crest on crest, trough on trough, and so on. Anywhere a crest meets a crest, constructive. Anywhere a trough meets a trough, constructive. Okay. So that's this central 
point within here. No matter what I do, there will always be a central maximum, okay? To either side of the central maximum, we notice areas of no waves. So we call this N1. And since it's repeated on the other side in a mirror-like fashion, N1 prime. N for node, okay? Then next to that, we get antinodes on either side. So A1 and A1 prime. Does not matter whether you put the prime on the left or the right, okay? Moving along next to that, N2, N2 prime, okay? And then you get A2 prime and A2, and then you get N3. And then you get A3. Okay? And N3 prime. Now, you don't really have this picture, but if you go down onto this drawing that you do have, you can start to mark these points in for yourself. So what you'll have right in the middle is you will have that anti-node line, and it'll basically be anywhere crests and crests are meeting. Right? So right down the middle. Okay? If you look over here, here's another anti-node line, right? Where crests are crests and troughs are troughs. And you'll notice that you get this kind of, oh, that's not a good color. You'll get this kind of like, oh, that's my straight line. Hang on, sorry. Let's just fix that to the pen here and draw that in. So right here, oh, that's really hard to draw nice and smoothly, but try your best to draw it as smoothly as you can. Right? See how I'm hitting where crests are meeting crests? So these, this is my central maximum, and these are my anti-node lines. Remember, anti-nodes is constructive interference, right? Now, in between the two is where you'll find those nodal lines. Okay? This doesn't really do a great job because it doesn't show a difference between crests and troughs. Okay, but basically, if you imagine that in between here is a trough, you'll see that this crest is crossing over a trough, crest over a trough, crest over a trough, and so on. Right? If we go one step further, you can get actually one more anti-node in here, which is right here. Let's make sure we label these right. I'm not going to draw the whole thing in just because it makes, it doesn't really, okay, and so on. And then I'm going to put my N2 values in here as well. N2 and N2 prime, okay? So nodes are where we have destructive interference, anti-nodes are where we have constructive interference. So now the next question I want to ask, because there's always math involved with this stuff, is if I am at my central maximum, okay? And let's pick a point on the central maximum, okay? I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick, let's find a nice colored dot. I'm going to pick this point right here, okay? How many, and I'm going to label these things as S1, and S2, source 1 and source 2, okay? So that's where the waves are coming from. How many wavelengths away from source 1 is this point? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4 wavelengths. I'm going to call this... P. Okay? So what I'm counting is crest, 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 crest. One, two, three, four. So what I can say then is that the distance between S1 and P, okay? So you know from math class, if you put a line over top, it means line S1 to P. Well, 
Maybe they don't teach you that, I'm not sure. But if you put a line over top, it means a line between these two points equals four wavelengths. A line from S to to P equals, let's count, one, two, three, ah, four wavelengths. So let's write down an important note right now. Note. Any point along C, the central maximum, any point along C will be an equal number of wavelengths. Why can't I? Oh, that's what I want. Equal number of wavelengths from S1 and S2. So what is the result of that? This means there will be constructive interference. along C, okay? You will always have constructive interference along C, this line here, because you always have an exact equal number of wavelengths coming. And I'm gonna draw this in just to try to help you visualize, okay? So if we have like this kind of thing going on here, and this kind of thing going on here, uh. You'll notice that both of these are on the upswing. They're both at the crest point exactly when they meet here, right? One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. No matter where I do that, if I go to the next one, it'll be the same, but it'll be five. If I go here, it'll be four tro or five troughs, right? If I come to the middle, it's one, two, and a half, one, two, and a half, right at the middle. So no matter where I am, we have constructive interference coming along here, okay? And any point along here, right, if this is exactly in the middle, is equidistant from each of those. Okay? So this is an important point. Now, let's move over to any point within the nodal region. Okay? I'm going to pick this point right here. We'll go in brown. Or maybe this point right here, how about? Okay? Uh, I don't know why that just did that. But any point right here. Okay. Any point along this nodal line. Okay. So now let's make this into. Uh, you know what? Let's change this back to P1. Makes more sense. So we're going to call this point, this orange point here. We're going to call it P2. I want to count the number of wavelengths from S1 to P2. So. I want to know the number of wavelengths from S1 to that point on the nodal line. So it's one, two, three, and a half. Three and a half wavelengths. Okay, that's interesting. And let's see what S2 to P2 is in terms of number of wavelengths. Do you have a prediction as to what it'll be? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Oops, I'm on the wrong nodal line, actually. I'm on N2, but the point still is here, and we'll do it again on nodal line one. But one, two, three, four, five. Five wavelengths. Let me just find one more point for you guys just to show you this again uh, slightly differently. Let's go over to this line, and let's pick a point. Uh, let's pick this point right here on that nodal line. I don't know why it keeps doing that. So if we call this P3, okay, let's do S1 to P3 and S2 to P3. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to there, and let's count from here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and a half. Okay. 
So this should maybe be triggering something in your head here, okay? And we'll go back to this and deal with this in just a minute again uh, and see what happens on the other antinodal line. But I think the main point that you want here is to talk about this concept that on nodal lines, the path length difference between S1, P1, and S2, P1, or let's just call it P. Sorry, let's just call it P. Don't call it P1. Just call it P, because you'll get confused otherwise. Just call it P. S1 to some point on the nodal line. So on nodal lines, the path length difference between S1 and P, P being any point on a nodal line, and S1 being the distance to the source from there, and S2 being the distance from the source from there, okay, will always differ. by exactly half a wavelength. And what this therefore means is, therefore, on nodal lines, crests meet troughs, and vice versa. Put an extra E in there. <laughs> so what does that mean? You always have destructive interference on nodal lines. Okay. So just to finish up here, let's just quickly look at one more antinodal line and see the difference. So pick any point on an antinodal line Let's call it this one here. Let's call this P4. Well, from S1, we've got one, two, three, four wavelengths. And from here, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six wavelengths. So we differ by exactly a whole number, right? So if you think about it, what that means is waves are overlapping with themselves. You might have this. But that's still going to lead to constructive interference. It doesn't matter how many times the wave went. If crests are with crests and troughs are with troughs, we have constructive interference. Versus if they're off or moved or offset by half a wavelength, you get this kind of a thing going on. And if these are added together, they're going to cancel one another out, right? Now, tomorrow we're going to get into the math of this and how it all works, but this is the general explanation as to why this happens.